Hello again from sunny California. I'm still here, and um, somehow I managed to do everything I could possibly do to get home today and deal with all this stuff going on back there and around me here, and, and then I find myself saying, okay, well, may as well do a little podcast here because I found a really cool article that's worth looking at, especially if you're interested in Naki and Magic and John Dee and Edward Kelly and all of that entheogenic uh, debate surrounding whether or not uh, Stanwyck, a big, a big time Enochian fellow who was involved in the master class of Enochian magic that Jason Augustus Newcomb and his new Hermetics puts out, which is great. Uh, The Aaron Leach stuff is great and uh, is a proponent of the fact that John Dee and Edward Kelly never, ever touched or knew or experimented with anything to do with entheogenic, hallucinogenic, or psychoactive substances. Um, so Sten, that's Stenwick's opinion. He also wouldn't, he would vehemently oppose you using those things involved with Anunnakian magic or uh, such practices. And in general, I agree with most such stuff. I'm a proponent of, of sober magic practice, especially in your initial 10 years of, of daily practice. But there's an interesting article out from P.D. Newman called Red Powder and Archangels, DMT, and Sir Edward Kelly's Angelic Alchemy. And P.D. Newman, if you don't know, is a, is a world-renowned author. His new book is Alchemically Stoned, The Psychedelic Secret of Freemasonry. Now, I had no idea that that there was that much in Freemasonry that was hallucinogenic at all, though, of course, my friendship with Chris Bennett has educated me with many different stages of such things that have come in and out of, of tradition and fad. They occasionally have been vogue, sometimes not vogue, but it's worth looking at. Um, anyway, P.D. Newman, according to this... Uh, His acclaimed title provides final evidence once and for all on the use of hallucinogenic entheogenic substance within old-time Rosicrucian orders such as the Fratres Lucis, Gold und Rosenkreuzer, and the Rite of Cagliostro. In this series, Mr. Newman shares some of his brilliant insights for readers. Now, you can check out the whole series on Sam Robinson's pansofers.com, which, of course, is a wonderful website of scholarly-like additions and excavations of our Western mystery tradition. And uh, let's just dive into what P.D. Newman says. He says, From visions of mystical beings of light to abductions by trans-dimensional alien-like spirits, one of the most common experiences reported by users of DMT, dimethyltryptamine, and other entheogenic compounds is that of contact of with what is repeatedly described as angelic entities. Usually I hear reference more to spiritual entities or or ancestors and stuff like that, though I think uh, the framework that you enter into, the paradigm you hold as you go into those realms actually is quite significant and can lead you to different parts of those realms, in fact. Um, For some of you who might not know much about this, uh, DMT, of course, is the active ingredient in ayahuasca, and it is also what is produced by our pineal gland, so it's an endogenous substance in our bodies and in in a lot of organic life. Quote, all spiritual disciplines describe quite psychedelic accounts of the transformative experiences, encounters with angelic entities, heavenly sounds, contacting a powerful and loving presence underlying all of reality. These experiences cut across all denominations. They are also characteristic of a fully psychedelic DMT experience. And that quote is from uh, Strassman, Rick Strassman, who's, of course, a big author in this field. I also think it is good to remember that it does us benefit to not classify spirits so much as angels or demons and uh, think of them more as just spirits doing a job. We might understand what that job is. We might not understand what that job is. That job might be good. That job might be actually bad, quote-unquote. 
As Mark Hoffman rightly observes in his paper, Conjuring Eden, Art and the Entheogenic Vision of Paradise, the tree, Hebrew word etz, in fact is not translated by the ordinary words for tree in Greek, dendron, and Latin, arbor, but literally by wood, cylon, chylon, lignum, stick, timber, and only secondarily a living tree. The wood of life and the wood of the knowledge of good and evil could therefore theoretically have both come from one and the same tree. Similarly, the Hebrew word usually translated as fruit, pri, could just as well imply a product, i.e. a substance produced from wood. Now normally, if I was going to comment on that, what you want to do in Hebrew is what, what's called a word study, and you want to look at that exact word and you want to then cross-reference it, and there's books that let you do this, with every other usage in the same text, in this case, the Hebrew Bible, or as many of you call it, the Old Testament, though that's a really outdated term for it, uh, and cross-reference the same word and in every other case that that word is used. So there's books that we use in biblical scholarship, and we look up a word, and it gives you every single time in the Bible and in extra-biblical literature, like the, the Targums, the, the Midrash, of where that word is used. And then you go look up the usage of that word in every single instance, and you compare them. That is how word study is done in Hebrew, and that makes sense. Um, so I haven't done that here, so I'm just going to take them at their word. <laughs> Moreover, like vegetable starches, gum arabic serves to this day as a foodstuff in many parts of the world and may actually sustain one for extended periods. In that respect, gum arabic is a veritable product of the wood that gives life. DMT, however, is produced from the wood which imparts knowledge. That is, it's found in a different part of the acacia altogether, the roots. So DMT can be extracted from acacia roots. Um, of course, uh, Chris Bennett told me that acacia was what they often burned in the Holy of Holies, perhaps. So if they burned the acacia roots and were consuming DMT smoke to talk with God, uh, they definitely were burning cannabis. Um, so this is still not confirmed, but it's highly argued. Coincidentally, in his Egyptian rite of Freemasonry, Count Alessandro di Cagliostro actually identifies the biblical tree of Eden as a species of acacia. And that's interesting. That's very interesting. Quote, the acacia is the primal matter. My child, you are receiving the primal matter. Learn that the great God created before man this primal matter and that he created man to possess it and be immortal. Man abused it and lost it, but it still exists in the hands of the elect of God, and from a single grain of this precious matter becomes a projection into infinity. It really does seem like DMT puts you as, as seemingly physically in the astral plane, and uh, I've, I've done only just over 20 major trips of it, so I don't really have any conclusive advice yet, though I have uh, a lot of questions and uh, look forward to doing uh, more experiments in controlled ritual environments, including using Enochian environments to do it. It doesn't take much to see what that what Cagliostro here describes is nothing short of the entheogenic potential of acacia wood. Further, it is perhaps notable that for the singular purpose of communicating with unseen angelic presences, not unlike these sessions with Kelly, the enigmatic Cagliostro was in the practice of using young seers during the rituals of his Egyptian rite. So yeah, it looks like uh, early Freemasonry definitely made use of entheogenic substances. That's cool. Kelly Edward Kelly, provides us with yet a further clue regarding the nature of this red powder in his poem Metrical Treatise on Alchemy, chiding the pseudo-alchemists and so-called puffers for their inadequate learning of in the royal art. Kelly ironically instructs his reader to go burn your books and come and learn with me. And here's the poem. All you that fain philosophers would be 
and night and day in Gaber's kitchen broil, wasting the chips of ancient Hermes' tree, weaning to turn them to a precious oil. The more you work, the more you loose and spoil. To you, I say, how learned soever you be, go burn your books and come and learn of me. Well, that definitely looks like uh, a solid argument for <laughs> what's being said. And uh, Edward Kelly and John D. may very well. Uh, I mean, it's, I think it's anyone who argues this, I think, is just is very close-minded. Um, that they were experimenting with, with psychedelic substances. I think that's very likely. How much they integrated that into their development of Anakian magic, who knows. But it sounds like uh, D was supervising Kelly while Kelly was using mushrooms, I th from, that's from my own research, as well as other entheogens, to uh, facilitate and improve his uh, scrying and contacting of these beings. And uh, it would make sense that if they might have been using DMT to use, to contact the angel Ave and the other main angels, Gabriel and such, and go back to those same beings and get guidelines from them. And uh, that might have even developed their own scrying ability to do it without the substances. Or maybe the substances were used just to augment uh, the already developed abilities that Kelly's alleged to have had. Kelly's smug arrogance aside, one cannot help but wonder as to which tree and to what precious oil prepared therefrom our alchemist come scryer may be referring. That Kelly's red powder could have been a form of DMT would go far in explaining the regular angelic visitations experienced by Kelly during his sessions with D. Yeah, but so would regular scrying. Let's not forget that. I mean... It's it's a, I found with people who believe that only psychedelics are real and and the rest of magic's all in your head, the problem of discounting actual spiritual practices. I mean, these spiritual practices are real. They do do what they do. Um, and if you were to say to someone like Ashen Chassan or Doctor Skinner or any of these other masters of evocation out there that unless they're consuming psychedelics, it's not real, well, they would have a hard time with that. Um, can psychedelics bolster your abilities or even create shortcuts for people without abilities? Perhaps, probably. Um, the control factor is the hardest thing. Um, the one time I did uh, Enochian magic and scryed an ether, and it was with Lon Milo Duquette, uh, I got stoned and the hardest the, the weird thing about it was it didn't make the experience any more profound at all my body still had very physiological reactions to the Enochian work as I always do to Enochian work and like including numbness and then ejection as I travel in the spirit vision to the to the ether um, but what the what the cannabis did in that instance uh, of a very successful working scrying text was made it harder for me to focus and I kept losing track of my, of my focus and my vision and my scrying and my traveling. So that, I noticed, was a detrimental effect of the cannabis that I think a lot of other people have experienced. Um, and there's probably a fine balance for people who are weak in sensing but strong in will that they try and strike as they increase their sensing ability with uh, entheogens and psychoactives, but try and maintain their will of control and direction. And that's where working with a, a magician, seer, scryer combination really comes in useful. Uh, I love being the scryer and having a magician just direct me and I can put myself fully in the receptive mode. I also like being the magician and guiding the scryer uh, because I can usually strike a good balance where I'm also perceiving things and confirming things as well, as so we can test things out together. And I, I like to do it on my own as well. And again, I've worked a long time to have that, both those abilities in, in quite a balance in me. So, yeah, as we noted um, in the opening contact scenarios, that the angel-like beings is one of the most common experiences reported by users of DMT. Absolutely. You definitely experience beings that are very real, more real than beings in this world, in fact. Furthermore, we know that psychoactive compounds truly did play a rather significant role in both alchemy and in these seances. 
As Chris Bennett observes in his magnum opus, Libra 420, Cannabis, Magical Herbs, and the Occult. And I believe he means, means opus magnum, but magnum opus is the colloquial phrase. It's not correct, but it's colloquial, just so you all know. It doesn't really matter. Here's a quote from my buddy Chris, who, of course, you can find a little interview I did with him earlier on this podcast. What does Chris say? In Dee's own accounts of his invocations, or actions as he referred to them, there are numerous references to smoke indicating the possibility of some sort of fumigation, as well as references to the use of potions and ointments. In Dee's record of these actions, we must we read how smoke filled the place, and an invoked entity states, I smell the smoke, proceed, sir, in your purpose, and these could in- indicate suffumigation. Other references indicate some sort of elixir in use. Taste of this potion, yea, the savor only, only of the vessel worketh most extremely against the maimed drowsiness of ignorance. If the hand be heavy, how wait the ponderous shall be the whole word be. And ponderous shall the whole word be. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I think it's it's very naive for, for Anaki magicians to look back at references to potions, oils, and incense and assume that they were completely non-psychoactive and non-entheogenic and just because we live in the post-war on drugs world and our bottom line assumption is that anyone who would do that is breaking the law and bad. That's, that's being locked in our own hermeneutic horizon. And you want to be able to realize that back in those times, that was not a problem. As Thomas Hatzis mentioned, emphasized, there's frequent references to the use of opiates in the Bible, as well as using mandrake for psychoactive experiences. So um, there was no taboo in these things back then. Just like 100 years ago, we gave kids cocaine for toothaches. We need to throw our minds back into the mentality of of older times and think like they thought to understand what their assumptions would have been. In one account of John Dee's actions with spirits, 1581 to 1583, there is a lament about the lack of drugs for an operation and with the use of ointments in their place. Quote, I have forgotten all my drugs behind me. But since I know that some of you are well stored with sufficient ointments, I do intend to visit you only with their help. You see, all my boxes are empty. Edward Kelly. He showeth a great bundle of empty potentiary apothecary boxes. This brings a response from the figure invoked. How cometh it you pretend to come for a favorable divine power and all your boxes are empty? So the... The exchange over the lack of drugs also indicates that drugs were not an unusual part of these scrying sessions, as Kelly says he forgot them, as if he usually had them. That's very interesting to have Edward Kelly apologizing to an angel or spirit for not having drugs in his box. (laughs) And that, again, is from my brother Chris Brennett's book, Libra 420. Actually, it's vague whether or not that is from there, though I believe it is, but the uh, footnotations here are not done technically right, so it's vague. Um, A couple notes I I glossed over that are worth mentioning. From Zosimos' use of cannabis-infused wines to Raymond Lull's discovery of alcohol distillation to Paracelsus' fondness for opium to Cagliostro's elixir elixir of acacia, DMT. The royal art is by no means ignorant of the divine psychoactive mysteries possessed by Mother Nature. Also, Dee's biographer Elias Ashmole was the first to commit Kelly's adventures to writing. In his Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum, 1652, Ashmole falsely claimed that Dee and Kelly had discovered the substance and text while investigating the ruins of Glastonbury Abbey. It is generally reported, quote, that Dr. D and Sir Edward Kelly were so strangely fortunate as to find a very large quantity of the elixir in some part of the ruins of Glastonbury Abbey, which was so incredibly rich in virtue, being one upon 272330, that they lost much in making projection by way of trial before they found out the true weight of the medicine. Ashmole published a collection of alchemical manuscripts in 1650, 
uh, Fasciculus Chemicus, which included a work by one Arthur D., the son of Dr. John D. Two years later, he published his more important work, Theatricum Chemicum Britannicum, an extensively annotated compilation of alchemical poems in the English language. Not surprisingly, in The Origins of Tantra Drugs and Western Occultism, 1990, OTO ritual discloser Francis King said of the Theatricum Chemicum Britannicum, I think Ashmole refers to the processes designed to extract hallucinogens from plant and animal substances. There we go. The idea that, that DMT, which is, you know, nicknamed Spice, uh, I think which is definitely a reference to Dune's Spice Melange, extending consciousness and life, the idea that, that this red spice of DMT could be the red stone in alchemy is highly likely. I think it's highly likely. And um, the more we undercover what these things, the roles that these entheogens have played in world history and religion, as we slowly unredact how our miseducation in history, and especially of religion, um, yeah, more questions arise and they're worth exploring. Uh, the spiritual state of the red stone or the red work in alchemy is is uh, often in contradistinction to the white work. And we can talk about that other places and times. But, you know, the idea of the red lion and the creating of the soul philosophorum as being a, a vision or a state in which you can communicate and perceive these other realms. Yeah, it's, it's not something that is divorced from the engagement with entheogens, and that has just become really indisputable at this point. So any, any occultists out there saying that, that the two are, one, that one is a corruption of the other are, are just at this point out of date, out of date. That's some, we might start calling it Reagan-era occultism, you know, those of us who grew up saying, learning to just say no, um, I think, again, I think it's really good to learn magic and practice it without any sort of substances whatsoever um, and hone your skills. But maybe later on in, in your advanced adept workings, you should uh, experiment as you see fit, as you are called to do. It really depends on temperament and who you are and who you're working with. And obviously you want to be as careful as, that, as anything is this is your consciousness, and it is precious and cannot be replaced. Remarkably, that Dee and Kelly habitually employed the use of drugs during their actions has been picked up by a number of authors, including Ben Johnson, author of The Alchemist. This is the famous Ben Johnson, so 1610, a satirical play which makes a number of references to Dee's use of elixirs, potions, drugs, and other sacred medicine that will work some strange effect if he but feel it. M. Kinholtz, an ex-police officer who in Opium Traders and Their Worlds, Volume 1, 2008, connects D. and Kelly with a narcotic incense composed of olibanum, storax, dictamus, opium, and hashish, and most importantly, Gustav Merink, author of Der Golem, The Golem, uh, a novel that makes cloaked references to psychoactive drugs in the language of alchemy, and Der Engel vom Westlichen Fenster, The Angel of the West Window, 1927, which tells the tale of a delusional man who, after inheriting a cache of Dee's papers from a relative, comes to believe that he is, in fact, a reincarnation of the Elizabethan magus. Acting on this grandiose psychological inflation, the protagonist of the story pursues initiation at the hands of an adept who presents our hero with a familiar red ivory sphere containing flaky purple granules and a grayish red powder. From Dan Mercure, a professor at Syracuse University, he says, Mayrink referred to two alchemical drugs. They are kept in two small ivory spheres, the one red and the other white. The color coding referenced the Red King and the White Queen, or Sun and Moon, of the alchemical wedding. The white sphere and its powder do not play a role in the novel. The red ivory sphere contains the royal powder, the red lion, which consists of flaky purple granules. It can be used to transform base metals into gold. But when it is prepared as an incense, it has a psychoactive effect. Inhaling the red smoke enables them to step out, of their bodies and cross the threshold of death. There, through marriage with their female other half, 
which in their earthly existence almost always remains hidden, they acquire unimaginable magical powers, such as personal immortality, as the wheel of birth comes to a standstill. In short, they achieve a kind of divine status, which is denied other mortals as long as they are ignorant of the secret of the white and the red spheres. Fascinating. If nothing else, with what all these fictionalized accounts indicate is a long-standing tradition directly associating Dee and Kelly with the use of what Aleister Crowley, an English magician who interestingly, not unlike Marion's hero, claimed to be the reincarnation of both Kelly and Cagliostro, called strange drugs. Well, that's quite the sentence. <laughs> Talk about a talk about a, a, a big dependent clause. Kelly and Dee finally parted company when, according to Kelly, the archangel Uriel, during one of Dee and Kelly's drug-fueled actions, instructed the two men to share all of their possessions, their wives included. After much protest, Dee finally conceded. In that's a mischaracterization of mischaracterization, if ever I've seen one, of how that went down. Uh, though I'm sure it was not great, but they worked together for quite a while after that. Um, D finally conceded. However, the adultery proving too much to, for the pious D. Shortly thereafter, he closed their sessions permanently. And it's definitely true that you know D had a you know a young beautiful wife, and Kelly didn't. And it makes sense. Kelly wanted to sleep with her. To make matters worse, not long after the two men shared partners, the aged D's young wife became pregnant. As Dee was sixty at the time, and Kelly was only thirty-two, it doesn't take much to determine that. The likely father of the child was Sir Edward. And that see that doesn't logically follow. Just because Dee was sixty doesn't mean that Kelly was probably the father, especially if Dee was sleeping with his wife every day and Kelly just slept with her once, but whatever. Kelly would eventually go on to be the court alchemist for Emperor Rudolf II, who knighted him Sir Edward Kelly of Imeni and New Lubin on February 23rd, 1590, but failing to produce alchemical gold for the emperor, Kelly was imprisoned and attempting to escape fell from a high window to his demise. That's not true. That's just not true. He, he, he broke his arm. Yeah. That's uh, crazy that people can write about this history and not actually even be accurate in the slightest. It's just, it makes the rest of scholarship hard to, hard to digest when they get basic historical facts wrong. It's one of the problems I have with, um, Empire of Angels, Louvre's book is like so many, like he says, you know, in, in Louvre's book, he says, Oscar Wilde died in prison. Like these, this, when, you, when you make these gross historical inaccuracies, it just shows a lack of detail to things that are so clearly known as they actually happened that it puts your other assumptions in doubt. I mean, you, I, I think you know what I mean. Like, if, you, if you're getting the battle, like it, one of the things I had a problem with, I tried, I even bought the hardcover illustrated version of the Da Vinci Code when it came out because I was like, I need to read this because everyone's reading this. And I was, you know, in doing grad school at the time and everyone was talking about it. And I was like, well, the only way I can handle this book is with pictures, with really nice pictures. So I, I but I couldn't get through the first 30 pages because the book gets so many basic historical dates wrong. Like if you're getting basic dates wrong, then why am I, the, the illusion, the suspension of disbelief is shattered. And if you're writing academically like this is trying to do here, and then you get basic information wrong, you know, it's just, it makes it hard. He, he did fail to produce alchemical gold, but I, from my journeys to Kelly's Tower in Prague where the emperor, I, I, you know, I, I know a lot about, how that actually went, and this is a lot very grossly re misrepresented um, and not accurate. And Dee was there with Kelly, and they grew mushrooms and stuff, but you don't hear that referenced. Why don't they reference that? Are they just not doing their research? Probably. Um, he fell from window to his demise, yeah, hogwash. But Dee and Kelly's angelic actions continue to fascinate, inspire, and perturb. We leave the reader with a haunting excerpt from Meyrink's novel Der Engel vom Westlichen Fenster, The Angel of the West Window, 1927, which finally illustrates the smoky narcotic air that surrounded the angelic activities of Dee and Kelly. Quote, Without further ado, he handed me the red sphere. After a brief search, I soon found where the two halves were screwed together. Was this not one of the spheres of John Dee and his apothecary Kelly? The sphere opened up. 
In the hollow was a grayish red powder, about enough to fill a walnut shell. I took the onyx bowl I used as an ashtray, poured some spirit from the scaling lamp into the bowl, lit it, took the half of the red sphere with the powder and poured it onto the flame. Soon the alcohol had burnt off. Slowly the remains of the powder bowl began to glow and smolder. A cloud of greenish-blue smoke formed and rose, curling up from the onyx bowl. The adept or the devil in person or whoever it was grasped me from behind by the hair with irresistible force and forced my face down into the onyx bowl and the incense rising from the red powder. A bitter, sweet aroma rose through my nostrils, and I was in the grip of an indescribable trepidation. I was racked by death throes of such long-lasting, excruciating violence that I felt the mortal terror of, my, of whole generations flow through my soul in the unceasing icy stream. Then my consciousness was obliterated. That definitely actually doesn't sound anything like DMT. That sounds more like 5-MeO DMT. With DMT, you're more going to just feel this departure out of your body and this engulfing sense of the sort of yeah it's it's not like that at all so it would be good if you're going to write fiction you know to know what you're talking about uh, i have retained almost nothing of what i experienced on the other side and i think i am justified in adding thank god for my torn off scraps of memory which swirl through my dreams like leaves in a storm are so steeped in horror that it seems a blessing not to be able to understand them in detail all I have is a vague, dark memory of having seen and passed through worlds such as those Frau Fromm described when she spoke of the depths of the sea steeped in a dull, greenish glow where she claimed she met Black Isaias. I, too, met something awful there. I was fleeing, terrified. I think it was from black cats with gleaming eyes and gaping mouths shining white. My God, how can one describe half-forgotten dreams? Mm. And I was fleeing, numb with nameless terrors. One last saving thought surfaced. If only you could reach tree. If only you could reach the mother, the mother of the red and blue circle. Is that it? You would be saved. I believe I saw the Baphomet in the distance, high above glassy mountains, beyond impassable swamps and painful hazards. I saw Elizabeth, the mother, waving to me from the tree. I cannot remember what the gesture signified, but at the sight of her my racing heart was gradually soothed and the numbness left me. I woke feeling I had spent a hundred years, hundreds of years in the depths, green depths. When I looked up, my head still swirling, the adept was sitting before me, his gaze fixed upon me, playing with empty halves of the ivory sphere. I was in my study around, was it as, as it had been before, before. Three minutes, that is sufficient, said the adept in a tone, his features haggard as he put his watch into his waistcoat pocket. I will never forget the puzzlingly disappointed expression on his face as he said to me, so the devil didn't take you after all. That indicates a sound constitution. Congratulations anyway. I think from now on you will be able to use this coal with a certain degree of success. It is char charged that I have been able to establish I bombarded him with questions about what had happened to me. It was clear I had been through the, one of the hallucinatory experiences that have always played an important role in supposed magic practice. I, um, I think that is a, a horrible, horrible representation of I, any form of astral scrying travel or psychedelic usage of DMT, much less in entheogenic spiritual contexts. Maybe there's some drugs that give you experiences like that, or uh, hysterical ecstatic states you might put yourself in if you're, if you're unprepared and haven't done years of magical training. But it, it's uh, very disappointing to me. So the fact that Dee and Kelly, I think, used these things is not represented well here. The fact that they used them is, is uh, becoming beyond dispute. Um, is really beyond dispute. Uh, representing how that would have looked and what that would have been like, I think is yet to be seen. And I hope that people like myself and others who are not afraid to venture into those realms and come from a traditional, magical, Western, Enochian background 
can uh, you know share some of our workings in years to come. Thanks for listening. Please uh, follow on Spotify or leave a review on Apple Podcasts, or you can always go to hermeticspiritualdirection.com and drop a donation, buy a cup of coffee, anything helps. And have a lovely day, you wonderful, awesome, wizardly witches and sorcerers.